This week, we're discussing the importance of how we frame our conversation about energy efficiency. And to do that, we welcome author Andrew Revkin, who will be our guest all of this week. Andrew is the author of Global Warming, Understanding the Forecast, and best known as a contributor to the New York Times blog that he started called the Dot Earth blog. He's on the line from New York City. Today, we'll explore the significance of the terminology we use to talk about global warming. Why does language matter when framing the climate change debate? Hi there, Andrew. Hey, it's good to be with you. Thanks a lot. I want to start with something that we actually picked up from one of your recent blog posts. And what you had said on that is that the idea of confusion over global warming often grows out of the meaningless of that phrase on its own. Tell me, what did you mean by that? Well, when you look at the social sur the surveys and polling and social science uh, examinations of cl climate change in people, you see that there's a, we all have different definitions of a vague term like global warming or climate change. It, when you talk in America to a conservative Republican, um, that phrase brings up all kinds of different uh, uh, meanings. And, and so what I try to do, and when you talk to a liberal, someone who is extremely freaked out about global warming, the same thing. They, they have a different uh, vision in their head of that picture. So, so as a blogger, of course, and a writer at the New York Times, I, I'm kind of in the midst of this din. And what I've tried to do for a long time is, is clarify first, what are you talking about? It, whenever I get into a discussion, whether on the blog or in person with someone, I say, what is it you mean when you say global warming? And again, the, the, it can be catastrophic un, un, unraveling of the global climate from the buildup of greenhouse gases. Global warming on its own just means a warming climate. It doesn't have any real meaning. So again, step one is, what do you mean by this phrase with anyone I'm talking to? What do you mean by the phrase when you use the phrase global warming versus climate change? How do you use them differently? Well, I try really hard, first of all, and, and here you get in all the strictures of journalism, even online. Uh, I try to always say human-driven climate change or human-driven warming of the climate or warming from the buildup of greenhouse gases. In other words, I try to actually describe what I'm talking about. Uh, again, though, it's because of compression, because of the lack of time and space, quite often you end up not being able to have all that clarity about what you're talking about. And so you end up with these phrases. Uh, when I write about global warming, and when I'm forced to compress it down to just those two words, I'm talking about the human influence on the climate system through the buildup of greenhouse gases that trap heat in the atmosphere. So it's pretty straightforward. By the way, that leaves out then, yet the, the, the most important question for society is not, is the world warming and are people driving it, but how dangerous is it? So that's a whole other level of meaning that can either be um, sort of left out accidentally of a conversation, resulting in a lot of clashing uh, views, or, or, well, basically, I feel it's vital to get some clarity there, too. You know what's interesting is that uh, environmentalists, many of them say that yes, people are skeptical about whether or not the world's weather is changing, but that the degree of skepticism depends on what that change is called. Do you agree with that? Well, you, you know, you, you touched on a word that I think is worth exploring a bit too, which is the word skeptic. There's this uh, overly simplistic vision of a climate skeptic that's often trotted out by one side or another. And there, too, there's a whole range of, of uh, interpretations and meanings. Uh, there are some people out there who just, for uh, internal reasons, look at the, a body of science who might be quite well versed in science and just not be convinced that there's a, a clear and present danger there based on their values and their, their sort of risk tolerance. And then there are other people who might be, have the same level of education and who would look at the same body of evidence and come up with a different conclusion. So, And then there are people who have a vested interest. There definitely are people who are consciously, who know that there is a growing influence on the climate from greenhouse gases and know that in the long run this could have big bad consequences, but who have either been paid or, or have some other professional reason to cast doubt on that. So again, there too there's another range of, uh, of responses and, and kind of, and this, this again begs for, for the, it really speaks to the importance of being clear. Well this debate uh, that's been ongoing for so long, I mean really is caught up in jargon. You, you point out environmental skepticism is one of the words that, or phrases that we throw around a lot. If we're not calling them environmental skeptics, what are we calling them? Well, what I try to do is, is get a clear sense. It's kind of like in, in uh, uh, actor training. There was this tradition of, uh, in, in the acting community of uh, being a method actor where you, you, have your, you have to know what's my motivation. 
So as a journalist, what I'm trying to do always is to kind of get behind what people are saying and, and into what makes them say what they say. And I feel it's really a, a responsibility of journalists as much as possible to not just say what someone is saying, but try to give some context on what, what the best, your best impression is and why they're saying that. Again, if they have a vested interest or if they're um, just purely ideologically passionate, that's an important distinction to make. And, and then once you do that, you, you leave the reader the option of figuring out how to weigh those different voices and uh, with, the, with the consciousness about you know, you know, what's behind the, the argument. And so I think there, too, we have this um, obligation in, in our field, in journalism particularly, to try to strip away you know, some of the, the backstory, as, as you call it. You mentioned uh, that the phrasing and the terminology we choose to, to use mixes often with politics. And I want to read something to you. This comes from a research paper that was recently released by the journal Public Opinion Quarterly, examining the importance of climate change language and politics. Here's some of what it found. Republicans were like, less likely to endorse that the phenomenon is real when it was referred to as global warming rather than climate change, 60.2% versus 44%. Whereas Democrats were unaffected by the question wording, it was about 86% for both. As a result, the partisan divide on the issue dropped from 42.9 percentage points under a global warming frame to 26.2 percentage points under a climate change frame. Andrew, how do you make sense of the sensitivity that Republicans seem to have with the term global warming? Well, you know, I'd like to say that that, that kind of analysis is deeply significant and shows something profoundly different about Republicans' attitudes on climate than those of Democrats. Uh, but, but really, when, in my sen sense, in watching this issue evolve over more than 20 years and reporting carefully and trying to get a sense again of what makes people think or care about something. By the way, it's different to think about something when someone asks you, uh, you know, what do you, how do you feel about global warming, mm. than it is to just observe a person's behavior and get a sense of whether this is something they actually care about. Care means a depth of concern that uh, for many Democrats and Republicans just isn't really there. So it's fine, you know, uh, there's a whole big body of people doing a lot of social science research on this. And some of it's very powerful and interesting, although I think a lot of this really doesn't leave, get, get you to much meaning. I think basically when you really push on people about the things they care about today, next week, this year, this issue, whether you call it global warming or climate change, is very rarely at the top of the list. But there, and that's again true across the ideological spectrum. But there is more politics uh, attached to the phrase global warming, is yeah, there not? Yeah, yeah. No, and I'm, yeah, well, I think what, it, what has happened is that the, um, in, in politics, people who are engaged in politics, people who actively identify themselves as a Republican or as a liberal, a Democrat, um, do get attached to the, these more subtle meanings of words. Words become more like a badge. Uh, in fact, there are some social scientists who've looked at the polarization that's evolved around global warming as uh, essentially the same as the polarization around gun rights or the right to life, uh, abortion. So they be these words um, and or these issues become uh, kind of an identity badge. I'm a Republican, therefore I doubt global warming. And that's, I think, that has been a powerful uh, tendency among those who are already most, um, most I ideologically um, polarized. And, and this has become an identity badge. And by the way, I think that's been unfortunate that, that the issue got sort of, I think through the mid-2000s, the, the um, the push by a lot of well-meaning people uh, who were pushing to kind of get this issue some traction from Al Gore to many others. Uh, in, in some ways it was politicized at that point because there was, an, a, there was an effort to attach the body of science to the a particular suite of solutions. In other words, global warming is a crisis and this is what we need to do, all in one sentence. And that made it impossible for many Republicans, I think, to, even if they had reasonable scientific education, uh, to kind of take ownership of this concept of global warming because, because it was already sort of framed as a liberal or a democratic idea. And oftentimes global warming is used in the political sense where, uh, you know, we have a significant snowfall that's somewhat quote-unquote unusual and politicians step up to the plate and say, look, that's proof there that that's not global warming. There's trouble with the word warming as well. Yeah, well, there, there's this whole other issue of uh, mixing up weather and climate. Uh, you know, weather is... Uh, what, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And in other words, climate is the average uh, conditions for a particular season in a particular region that established norms over a period of centuries or decades at least. 
and uh, climate change or warming is, is a change from that longstanding norm. And weather, again, can vary enormously year to year, even decade to decade, as science has revealed. So there is this tendency. In fact, there was some poll, I can't remember recently, uh, in America where they found that uh, depending on the season or, or the conditions when you asked a question about global warming, that, that actually torqued the answers, the responses you got based on what was outside the window. Hmm. What area that you argue is about greenhouse driven climate change and you say that each aspect of that from the basic physics onward has a different shape. Describe what you mean by a different sure. shape. Well uh, this gets back to my eagerness as a communicator to, to clarify as quickly as possible in a conversation or in a policy debate uh, what is it we're talking about? And so when, when you hear someone say that the science of global warming is powerfully established, again, I'd like to break that down. Well, what do you mean? And when you look at it carefully, the, the first thing, the things that are powerfully established are very basic ideas. Um, in other words, greenhouse gases function. We know that. It's a very powerful established theory based on a couple of hundred years of research in physics and um, atmospheric science that shows that if you take away carbon dioxide and water vapor and these other gases that keep the world would be about zero degrees centigrade average temperature and would not have liquid water and all that. So they function, we know that. So, okay, greenhouse gases warm the world, uh, more will make the world warmer. That is a pretty straightforward thing that even when I interviewed Michael Crichton who wrote a very you know, passionate novel uh, attacking environmental alarmism, but when I talked to him about it, he didn't deny that greenhouse gases function, he, he just felt that the risk level established uh, for a rise in the gases was not uh, where he thought was made it a big problem. And that's true of many of the scientists and, and others who, who count themselves as skeptics. They don't disagree on that. More greenhouse gases will warm the world. So that's what I call the shape of that idea. If you did a, like a bell curve of the views of an idea, that one is a tall, skinny curve. Mm. <laughs> now, here's the tough part. When you get into the issues about climate change that matter most to the average person, that matter most to society. How fast will sea levels rise in this century? Again, rising seas and a warming world is a no-brainer. It's a, that, that is another curve like this. We know that from looking at the history of climate and sea level, which is very easy to do uh, using geology and other means. So, so, so again, warmer world, rising seas, no-brainer. But warmer world, how, highs will, how, how high will seas rise by 2100? That's a much more complicated question because the big ice sheets of the world are very, again, not very well understood. They're not modeled well. The physics of uh, how you make them more slippery so that that ice slides into the sea quicker is not well established. So there you have a very flat curve, of, even among scientists who are deeply involved in the work. They're not skeptics. They're not professional deniers. They're people who just really don't feel we have a grasp on that question. And another one is how hot will it get? The most basic question, really, from a doubled amount of CO2, the, the carbon dioxide, in, in, or how hot will it get by 2100, another very important question. There's a high and durable level of uncertainty around that question. So that curve is not like this. Again, warmer world, more greenhouse gases, warmer world, warming world. Warmer world, less ice and higher seas, absolutely simple. But when you get to the things that make us decide what to do, they're mostly very complicated. And then one of the other tough ones, and, and this has been clear now for a while, is um, what's going to happen f for Toronto's climate or what's going to happen for the climate in sub-Saharan Africa? Will it get wetter or drier? Um, will you have um, some aspects of that forward-looking question are quite well established, like basically more, hot, what, more, more heat waves and hotter ones, yes. Um, but issues about, trans uh, about precipitation particularly are very tough. So uh, it's not like five more years of science will make it magically simpler <laughs> to figure out um, how Toronto has to, has to uh, gird for um, future weather. It's just not that simple. So that, that's why this is a tough, it's what some, uh, some uh, complexity theorists call this a super wicked problem because of these, <laughs> these, these factors. We have uh, just about a minute left, but I do want to ask you about one more term, Andrew. Uh, after this debate tonight, uh, after this, our discussion, we're going to have a debate about energy conservation. Um, and there is confusion and problems with that term as well, conserving energy. Delve into that one for me. Well, the two things that get conflated there are energy efficiency and energy conservation. Energy conservation is simply using less energy, meaning if you take the average year, the average life, you do things in a certain different way and you use less energy. 
If you use energy more efficiently, that means for each activity you're doing, you're using energy more efficiently. But uh, if that leads you to use more energy overall, then that hasn't really cut your energy use. So that's the key confusion point, I think, in that, in that realm. And how it's important for people to understand the difference there, too. Because going forward, if you're not actually reducing the use of energy in a way that re results in emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, then you're not really addressing the problem. Okay, Andrew, we're going to talk more about efficiency later in the week, but thank you for this great start today. It's my pleasure.